Well, we did a video on the Feistel cipher, and you know, hopefully people enjoyed learning about what I think is a really cool method of encryption. Now, I actually wrote some code for this, which we didn't end up putting in a video just because of time, um, but I did put it on GitHub, and you know, people, as soon as you put things on GitHub, people go, oh, I can contribute to this, which is a great thing. And so we've added some extra modes of operation. So I thought that's what we'd talk about today. Um, when you run a cipher, you don't just run it because it's only got a certain block size. So how, how do you do that? If you've got a file that's two gigabytes, but you've got a 128-bit block, then what do you do then? Right. So we're going to talk about modes of operation. We looked at the Feistel network, which, was, which is a symmetric cipher, and it's a block cipher. That means it takes an input of a fixed size and it outputs the same size. That's how block ciphers work, right? They take a fixed block. So that means that unless your message is exactly that length, we're going to have to do something to try and actually use this cipher for encryption, right? So day to day, when you're sending traffic over the network, the chances of it exactly being the right size for an AES block is obviously quite slim. So what is it we do? So we're going to look at three different modes that are going to get, I guess, progressively better. Right, we'll start with the rubbish one. Um, but perhaps the most conceptually simple. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about padding as well, because of course you might have too small a message and then we've got to think about it. So the first thing we could do is we could just naively say, well, look, let's just split our message into lengths of the, the right size and then encrypt each block at a time. Right? Now, if we get to a message at the end, which is too short, we could pad it in some way. Right? So this is called electronic codebook mode. And it kind of harks back to when there was a literal codebook that you'd flick through to get the, the codes. So we have our encryption algorithm. So this could be a Firestore network, could be AES, could be something else. And this is going to encrypt using some key. And we're going to put in our message message block one. So that isn't the whole message, maybe. That's just the first block of message, the first 128, the first 256 bits, depending on what your message is. And that's going to produce ciphertext one. Now, we can just repeat this process. So we can go message two, and then finally message three, because I've run out of paper again. The good thing is this is trivial to implement, right? If you have a cipher that works on a block, splitting it some bytes into blocks, not very difficult. Um, and then the encryption is also quite straightforward. This will have a decryption, so we just go back up this way. So we go message one, we can encrypt it to ciphertext one, and then we can decrypt it again back to message block one. This also has the advantage, but it's quite fast. If you've got maybe eight cores in your PC, or even more than that, you could do multi-threaded versions of this, where you could be doing these two at the same time, and all these ones over here. And so if you're decrypting things, that's going to be quite quick. And finally, if you want something in the middle of a big file, so let's say you're watching a streaming movie and you want to jump halfway through, you can do that because you can jump to whatever message or ciphertext block it is that we want to look at and then encrypt or decrypt it right then and there. So that's quite helpful. So this is electronic codebook or ECB. Nice as that looks, it's not at all secure and it's terrible. <laughs> uh, so, so, so don't quit, don't, don't implement it. Um, I've already done that online for you. Um, the problem with ECB is that it gives away just a little bit too much information about our message. Right? So the key thing here is that, assuming for a minute that this block cipher is good, then if we have a message that goes into this ciphertext, we're not going to be able to reverse that if we don't have the key. Right? So for now, we're assuming that the cipher itself is really, really good. So that's good on its own. But if message one and message three are the same, for instance, then they're going to do the exact same encryption, and we're going to get two identical ciphertexts, one and three. So blocks of our message are going to be identical. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but it depends on the situation, right? If I send you some money, let's say at regular intervals, and then sometimes two of those messages are the same, they know I've sent you the exact same amount of money. Now, maybe that's not a big deal, but the whole point of encryption is that you know nothing about the ciphertext, and we've learned something about that ciphertext. There's a really good example of this called the ECB Penguin. The ECB Penguin is an image that's had the header removed and the pixel data has been encrypted using electronic codebook mode. But the problem is that a lot of the image is the same, and so the encryption is exactly the same. So you can see these obvious patterns are still there, and so you, you can basically still see the penguin, right? It's, you've done nothing to hide it at all, really. That's an obvious example, but you can imagine that same problem might rear its head in normal internet traffic. Maybe the, the um, HTTP web request you put in is exactly the same every time, and so someone can learn this about your traffic. That's not a great idea. We're going to have to improve on this. What we want to do is we want to do something a bit like this, but when we have two identical messages come in, we're going to have them come out something different, right? And it's not clear how to do that because these keys are always exactly the same. So this function is the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to use something called cipher block chaining or CBC mode. We're going to take this ciphertext, we're going to come back up here, 
and we're going to XOR it with our message. And then we're going to take this ciphertext and we're going to XOR it with our message. Now, what this is doing is linking the output of one block to the input of the next block, essentially masking this message with some essentially pseudo random ciphertext. And that means that if these two messages are the same, these ciphertexts are going to be different. Now, before anyone complains in the comments, I've left out the IV. So we're going to have an initialization vector here which is another block of random which comes in here and is XORed with message one, right? This is so that if two message ones are ever the same, you don't see that, that the same ciphertext. Right? So the encryption is fairly straightforward. We take message one, we XOR it with some initialization vector, which is not a secret, right? That just gets, gets put in on the message, but it does have to be random. We encrypt that, we take this, we XOR, we encrypt, we take this, we XOR, we encrypt, and we can work this way through the file. Right. So this fixes the issue with e ECB mode, pretty much. Now, if message one and message three are the same, the IV and ciphertext two are not going to be the same, almost certainly, and so these will be different. And that's exactly what we wanted. If you encrypt your penguin with this, it will just look like random nonsense. Right? That's exactly what we want. Decryption on this is exactly the same as encryption, basically. It's just all the down arrows are now upwards. So ciphertext one goes just straight through here, is XORed with the IV, which was sent with the message and that gets just message one. This also comes over here, and, and when this comes up, it gets XOR to get message two, and so on. So it's kind of like the exact reverse process with decryptions instead of encryptions. The CBC was, for a long time, quite well used. It, it get used occasionally now. Right? There's a few issues with it. The first is that it's pretty slow. Right? It's pretty slow because we've lost that parallelism we had before. I can't now encrypt message three until I've finished encrypting message two, which I can't do until I've finished encrypting message one. If I'm watching a streaming movie and I've decided the first half's pretty boring and I want to jump through, sorry, you can't do that because you've got to chug through the decryption of everything first, right? On small files, that's not going to matter, but for big files, that could be a big problem. So it can't be paralyzed very well, right? It's, that's not very helpful. The other issue is that it's got a couple of security vulnerabilities. If an attacker messes around with ciphertext two, let's say on the network, when it comes to decrypt, that's going to impact what happens to message block three directly. You're going to be able to flip bits because of this XOR. That's not something you want to have happen, right? Because that allows the attacker way too much control over what comes out in this message, right? Now, if you change ciphertext two, this message two is going to be gibberish, right? Almost certainly, because it's not going to decrypt properly. But you could make interesting effects on message block three, like padding attacks and other issues like this are opened up with this kind of problem, right? So CBC mode is should we say better than ECB, but we're not, it's not good enough. If this is a long string of, um, of messages or, or parts, then, and you have a network problem or something like that, yeah. does that mess you up for the whole thing? Yeah, I mean, so if something happens even accidentally to ciphertext one, that's gonna totally mess up message one. It's also gonna feed in and totally mess up message two. It's not going to affect message three because that comes from ciphertext two and ciphertext three, which theoretically wasn't messed up. So you'll lose two blocks of decryption if a change happens on the ciphertext in one block. And to be fair, that's totally useless, right? Because we're going to have to resend that, me that message because um, that could be the most important part. Who knows? Um, that could be the bit of the movie I was trying to watch the whole time. So, so yeah, we, we, you know, this, is, this has a few drawbacks. And again, it's slower, right? We've got to wait for all these things to finish. These don't get used as much in practice anymore, right? In fact, ACB, almost never at all. Cypher block training is used for a few things, but not really. Um, what we do now is something called counter mode. Right. And the slightly more advanced, exciting sounding version, Galois counter mode, which is for a different video. Let's talk about what counter mode is and what the benefits it has are. What were the issues? Right? One is we want the messages to encrypt or decrypt into different ciphertext. Right? And that is because we don't want to divulge that two messages are the same. Right? The next problem we have is that we, don't we want it not to be nice and parallelizable. And we don't want that weird attack where you can fiddle about with ciphertext and it will affect other blocks, on the, on other message blocks. Actually, the solution is surprisingly simple in terms of its design, right? We don't have all this interconnectedness. It's much easier than that, right? What we're gonna do is we're going to have our same three blocks. So I think we may have talked briefly about counter mode in the crack attack, but I forgot what I said, so let's just say it again. So we've got our encryption algorithm. This operates exactly the same as it did before, but we're no longer encrypting our message, which is kind of confusing. What do you mean we're not encrypting the message? What we're gonna do is we're gonna encrypt a counter, and then we're get, that's gonna produce random ciphertext, which we're gonna use as our key, to XOR with our message. Right? So we're converting our block cipher into a stream cipher. Right? So we're gonna take a nonce, which is a number that's gonna be unique to this particular communication. Right? And we have to use this for a, for a number of reasons in terms of security. Right? So we're gonna have our nonce. 
So this could be a counter, so maybe for the first message it's one and the second message is two. It's not private, right? But you mustn't reuse it. And then we're going to start our counter. So this is block one. So we're going to have nonce plus one, or maybe nonce appended to one or something like that. You know, nonce plus two, nonce plus three. And that can go on, obviously, for as long as you've got enough bits in your counter. We're going to encrypt this. Now, what that's going to do, because remember, this encryption function is very, very good. And so the output appears essentially as random noise. Right. So this is going to produce 128 or however many bits of zeros and ones. And it's going to appear pretty random, even though we just put in the number one, and the number two here, and the nonce. So this is going to be the same. This is going to produce some more output that's 128. And this is going to produce some more output, which is 128 bits long. All we need to do now is do XOR, just like with a stream cipher. When we talk about stream ciphers, this is what you do. Your key stream generator generates a huge amount of this key and then you just XOR bit by bit with the message. It's the exact same process, we're just now doing it in blocks. So we're gonna take message one, this is gonna come in here and be XORed, and that's gonna be ciphertext one. This is gonna come in here, message two, ciphertext two, message three, I drew these in a different order every time. <laughs> there we go, ciphertext three. Right. Now, this has all of the properties we were hoping for from what I was just talking about. So first of all, because the, non the nonce is the same, but the counter is different for every block. So even if these messages are the same, different key material, different ciphertext. It's parallelizable. You can jump straight to this one and decrypt it by just trivially calculating this uh, nonce plus this number. This is much, much better. It has some drawbacks, right? We talked, in, when we talked about stream ciphers, about how they don't protect their ciphertext. Because this is just XOR, if I start flipping bits here as an attacker, bits are going to flip over here. So you're going to have to have something like a message authentication code, which we also covered in a video, um, to protect this. But from an actual encryption point of view, this is kind of exactly what we want. Right? Now a modern version of this would be something called Galois counter mode. It's exactly the same, it's just for as we go, based on these ciphertexts, we're calculating something called a GMAC, which is another of these message authentication codes, which is just going to stick some um, tag material at the end of the ciphertext that just says check against this to make sure that nothing has been changed. Right? It's going to protect that from being altered. Right? That's all that uh, um, Galois counter mode is doing. So you'll see that the majority of internet traffic is AES and Galois counter mode uh, and it's going to operate a lot like this. The other thing about counter mode which is quite neat is how you decrypt it. Right? A bit like the Feistel, right? We don't actually need decryption at all. We just use the exact same encryption process. So let's imagine I've sent you a message. You calculate nonce plus one. You encrypt it. You don't decrypt it. You encrypt it to get the exact same key material. You XOR with ciphertext one and message one pops out. Right? Because remember, if you XOR something twice, it undoes it. It reverses itself. Um, so actually, you don't even, if you've got a, an implementation of some cipher where the decryption is different from the encryption, you don't even need to bother implementing the decryption if you're using counter mode, because it's just the encryption that does both things. So if the no nonce, which I understand is the number that you use once, is yep. known, the number is known, yep. what's the secret bit, the key? Yes, this bit. So this function, because it's a good cipher, will turn this very predictable nonce plus one into a very unpredictable nonce and ones based on this key. If you take the key away, we can no longer perform that function. Right? It's worth noting that just like a stream cipher, if you ever reuse this nonce, what will happen is you've then got this issue where these bits are going to be the same for two different messages, and we can do things like crib dragging attacks to trivially extract bits of message. We don't want to do that. Right? So you have to be, when you're implementing something like this, extremely careful about not reusing a nonce. Right? So if you've got like a 96-bit nonce, that puts the that puts a hard limit on the number of messages you can send before you have to change your key. On the last video, actually, when I talked about the Faisal cipher, I did actually implement a Faisal cipher. Now, uh, I want to start off by saying that please don't use this Faisal cipher in production code because I wrote it and I have not given very much care and attention to how secure it is. Right? There's a few issues. Um, but actually, the actual Faisal network itself